Good evening, I'm Megan McMullen, and I am a seventh and eighth grade language arts teacher at Pekin. And my topic is neurologic, inside the middle school minds. Many times I will take a moment to stop and reflect and think about the classroom environment around me. And as I take this moment to stop and reflect, one stands out to me in particular. At one point, I stopped and noticed that one student was crouched in the corner, crying uncontrollably for some unknown reason. A second student was up out of his seat, flailing his arms about, acting as if he were a monkey. A third student was down on all fours, crawling underneath the tables, weaving in and out of the chair legs. And to much degree, I actually enjoy sharing this moment inside my classroom, because this is the reality. It is usually at this point in the story when I would ask one, what age do you think I teach? And they may start with, preschool? No, and I would ask them again. And maybe this time they would say, first, second, maybe third grade. And it is here what I would inform them that I am a middle school teacher, the age in which every parent can't wait for, right? But there's an unknown author that has said that adolescence is a period of rapid changes. And between the ages of 12 and 17, for example, parents may age as much as 20 years. However, it can be when we see these behaviors in our classroom, especially in seventh and eighth grade, it can be very frustrating because we may expect those from younger students. However, it makes sense from a developmental standpoint. Our students in young adolescents are going through a major structural change in their brain. Maybe something that resembles this, is how we see sometimes. However, this physical structural change is something that they need to go through to transition from elementary school into young adulthood. And so this idea of maturation is where the brain begins to develop from the back of the brain, eventually over time towards the front. And so as our young adolescents, the back of their brain is starting to mature, and this is what houses our most primitive, instinct, almost animalistic behaviors. While the prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped, housing our sound, reasons, judgment skills. And so it makes sense when we have students who are behaving in such ways without lack of reasoning. This process with our students, though, is very stressful to them. Not only is their brain physically changing, but they are going through many other changes such as physical, intellectual, social, emotional, moral developments all at the same time. And so we as teachers need to understand these stressors because that's not even accounting for any of the other stressors that may be affecting them outside of school and inhibiting their learning in the classroom. And so as teachers, what we can do is create a low stress environment. And I want to be clear that low stress does not necessarily mean that we have a low challenge environment. Because we actually want students to perform at what we call the optimal level of stress. And when students are under this optimal level of stress, they are performing at their highest peak. So we want students to experience some sort of stress because if they're not experiencing any, they are becoming disengaged. If they're experiencing too much stress, they're becoming anxious in the classroom. So teachers need to find that balance so that students can perform at their most highest peak of learning. We want students to understand this because it looks different as an elementary teacher, or I'm sorry, elementary student and learner than it does in a middle school learning environment. And so when we teach students about this, we want them to understand how their brains are interpreting information. And so it makes me think of this story that I had, or this conversation I had with a student, and he is a struggling reader, and we're working daily on his reading skills, and he says to me one day, Mrs. McMullen, if I don't have it by now, at the age of 14, I'm never gonna understand it. And I thought to myself, how untrue that really was. Because we have this idea of neuroplasticity, that our brain can, is changeable and malleable at any stage of our life, whether that's childhood, as it recently has been uncovered that it doesn't just apply to children, as maybe we had suspected before, but neuroscience tells us that it can affect adolescents and even adults. And so we want students to understand this because they need to practice and maintain those skills to keep those neural pathways open and especially in the adolescents as they're susceptible to synaptic pruning. 
In adolescents, when they are going through this pruning process, the brain is essentially eliminating neurons and neural connections that aren't being used. And while that can sound a little scary to think that your brain is being eliminated or parts of your brain are being taken away, that is indeed actually what is happening. But the brain is doing this for a reason. They're making room for those neurons that are having the strongest connections and eliminating the ones that are no longer needed. The brain knows what it, want, what it wants best for the most efficient information to happen. And so this is truly kind of a use it or lose it phenomenon for our students. Teachers are the ones who change, physically change our students' brains. And so teachers may be think, thought of as brain changers. And in fact, uh, Dr. Judy Willis, a neurologist who later became a classroom teacher, has said that teachers are performing bloodless brain surgery. And I like that term. I'm going to use that. And when uh, teachers are performing this bloodless brain surgery, what they're essentially doing is creating a new neural pathway in our student's brain. And when they create that new neural pathway, it's important that we understand what that actually is like. And so a new neural pathway is like taking a new path in the woods. You know, the first time it's full of uncertainty, there are obstacles in the way, and we really can't find our way to the end. But the more and more that we travel it, the more familiar it becomes, the faster and smoother the ride is. And the same is true with our learning. The more we practice it, the faster and smoother that learning can become. As teachers, we not only need to understand that those new neural connections are needing to be practiced with our students, but we need to be intentional about our connections. We need to make connections to our students' previous learning, knowledge, and experiences. And one way that teachers can do this, especially in middle school, is to make sure that maybe we are creating units that are interdisciplinary and integrated from other subject areas. And I've been fortunate enough to work with other professionals who share the same vision. And it is very rewarding as a teacher for when we see those aha moments in our students and they see that those connections from the bigger picture, those puzzle pieces are coming together. We want to make sure that the more we're making, the more we're establishing our connections and creating new neural pathways, that we are physically changing our brain. Because our brain thrives for patterns. When our students' brains are changing over time, they are all over the place. Maybe, quite literally, at some times, we think this is what it might look like, but they are struggling to find a place or a balance. And so as teachers and adults, we need to be there for our students because we often think that as adolescents, they need to be independent. And while that's true to a degree, we need to understand that they can't do everything independently and we need to be able to be there and guide them through that process. This kind of reminds me of an idea from my previous story of the children crying in the corner and the boy crawling underneath the table. We might think of those as toddler behaviors. And oftentimes, middle schoolers and toddlers can actually be pretty comparable. They both seek autonomy, yet what they really need is boundaries. They need to make sure that their actions are being held accountable. And so as adults, what we can do is lead by example. When our students, especially young adolescents, become argumentative, moody, and uh, emotional at times, what they need is someone who is calm. They need someone who can help guide them through that situation. Because if we are acting argumentative back towards them, this only increases the intensity of the situation. And so we lead by example, because even if we think our students aren't watching us, they are. And too often or not in our classrooms when we see our students learning, many teachers are easy to praise students simply for just finding the right answer or having the right and final product. But what we have learned is that research has told us that while the right answer and the final product might be true and is indeed important, in fact, the learning path in which we take to get to that right answer and which we take to get to that final product is actually more beneficial. Because we know that learning looks something like the top. It's all over the place. It can go front to back. 
right to left, diagonal to diagonal. It is not a linear process. And so in elementary school, students may be familiar with the concept of their teachers praising them for getting the right answer and at a fast pace. However, in middle school, that might not always be the case as our curriculum is quite different. There are far more open-ended questions and far less black and white answers. I had a student who would not participate if there was open-ended questions for the fear of getting them wrong. And so my job as his teacher is to, first of all, make sure that we are in an environment that is creating a safe place for his voice to be heard without fear of judgment or threat. But also help him understand that it's okay if we don't have the right answer. And sometimes there's not going to be a right answer, especially in those open-ended questions. And so we need to help our students understand that learning comes from sharing your voice and your opinion and your thoughts so other people can form new ideas from them. Because after all, learning is not just proving what we already know. And so young adolescents in whole are often looked at with a negative connotation. They're combative. They want to be individual, yet they conform to groups. They're egocentric. They challenge ideologies. And we maybe as adults find that that's frustrating. But if we take the time to really get to know them, we know that they just want acceptance from adults and that they really care about their, their environment and themselves and their friends. And so Dr. Judy Willis has said that it's not about me and it's not about you, but it's about the path in which we take to learning and teaching and it changes the brain for the better. Thank you. <laughs>